Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. And thank you so much for joining us this evening for another event with our partners, My Menopause Centre. And on this occasion, we're looking at how to get a handle on your hormones, demystifying the female and the male menopause. Before I hand over to Helen, who will chair this evening's event, I want to remind you of a couple of housekeeping points. Please post your questions and thoughts in the chat function at the bottom of your screens and feel free to post throughout the presentation. There'll also be time for questions at the end. And this event will run for one hour and it is recorded and we will mail it afterwards to everybody who's registered. So I'd like to hand over now to our panel chair, Helen Lemoyle, who is co-founder of My Menopause Centre. Helen has held chief marketing officer roles across the healthcare, beauty, broadcast, furniture and property sectors and is a self-described women's wellness champion. Over to you, Helen. Thank you very much, Aideen. Uh, it's great to join you again this evening. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I know it's turning out to be, certainly here in the Midlands and Nottingham, a sunny evening on the back of a very, very wet and windy day. Um, now, as we mentioned in the invite for this webinar, the buzz around the menopause and its impact on women has made us all aware of the vital role that hormones play in a woman's body, especially as she goes through the menopause. But the conversation around the menopause has also shone a light on male health and in particular male hormonal health, especially the role of testosterone and how falling levels affect men as they age. Indeed, a question that Dr. Claire and I often get at our events is, is there actually a male menopause as well? So to answer those questions and much more, we're joined by two brilliant experts in women's and men's health, Dr. Claire Spencer, my good friend and co-founder at My Menopause Centre, a GP and registered menopause specialist, and Dr. Anand Patel is a men's health specialist at the brilliant Centre for Men's Health. So Dr. Claire and Dr. Anand, Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now, I know when we were preparing for the session and in the events that we respectively do, people are often surprised to hear that both men and women have all three sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. It would be great if we could just kick off with you helping us all to understand the role that they each play for women. Claire, if you could pick that and then and, uh, for men uh, with an and. Yes, thank you, Helen. Thank you for the introduction. And it's great to be here again this evening. So as Helen said, in a woman's body, we have three main sex hormones, and that's estrogen, that's progesterone, and that is testosterone. And before I go on to talk about what each one does, I just want to say from the get go that mo although the experience shared the, the, the experiences that we're going to talk about are shared by many. They're also shared by others who aren't necessarily defined by male and female as a, giant, as a gender binary. But if we just talk of a female body, estrogen is really important. It's the key hormone in the development of female um, sexual characteristics. So the secondary sexual characteristics, which include breast development, fat redistribution, and pubic hair growth, the fact that we have a higher um, voice is generally down to estrogen. Estrogen has many, many roles in the body. Also, as we know, because of the plethora of menopause symptoms um, as we lose estrogen, but it's really important for um, bone density maintenance, muscle strength, really significantly affects our brain, um, even down to brain repair and the amount of energy that the brain has to use. And it's really also um, vital to maintain the integrity and health of our sexual organs. So the womb, the vagina, the cervix, and also the bladder has estrogen receptors. So it's really difficult to find a part of the body that estrogen doesn't affect, but it, it is mainly um, responsible for our, how we are as women. Progesterone has a lesser role, but it's still really important. Progesterone made by the ovaries, the main function is to prepare the body for pregnancy if there is a pregnancy. And progesterone also can affect our bone health. Um, progesterone we know has an effect on the brain, but not necessarily as important as that of estrogen. 
And then everybody's always so um, fascinated to know that we also have testosterone circulating in our blood. That doesn't mean that um, the the um, male characteristics necessarily display themselves, but testosterone has a really important part to play in our brain, in maintaining bone and muscle health, and also for maintaining the health of the vagina and sexual organs also. So it's really fascinating how it'll be interesting to hear Dr. Anand talk about the same hormones, but in the male body. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I mean, it's great to hear Claire talking about that because actually it's very similar in, in, in men. I mean, we, we again have all these three sex hormones. Estrogen in men is actually very important to strengthen our bones. Without that, we will often have bone density problems and osteoporosis. Progesterone is more as a precursor for testosterone, although we are finding out more over time that it does have its own role in our bodies and potentially you know, even related to anxiety reduction, which is something you know, certainly it's important in women. And then finally, we've got testosterone, which is the sort of hormone most associated um, with, with men. Um, certainly it switches on in the womb at about sort of a month in, and then we're, after that we're bathed in it. Um, and as, as Claire said, it affects our brain, so motivation, um, uh, excitement, interest, desire, um, it, it grows body hair, improves our muscle strength, again strengthens our bones, helps our heart health, as does oestrogen, um, reduces our risk of diabetes, controls our cholesterol to a much better level, is important for body composition, so trying to maximize that muscle versus fat density, um, and then of course, you know, uh, male sexual characteristics, um, sexual desire, penile growth, testicular development, sperm um, uh, growth and development. So you know, a huge range of things that it does, even, even helps you make blood. Um, so these are absolutely essential hormones for, for, for men and women and non-binary people, and they work in different ways. And we know that in non-binary people and trans people, what we're doing is trying to stimulate the puberty through which they might go um, of, of a different gender to which they were assigned at birth. So actually, it's, it's, it's really important for, for, for broad people. That's great. So really helpful to have that overview of, you know, both male and female bodies have the three hormones, but they, and, and in some ways they are operate and do similar things, but their impact and how they fluctuate as we age is different. So maybe Claire, if we kick off with you, if you could maybe just um, spend a moment talking us through the menopause and the menopause transition in particular and what happens to those hormones as we transition through menopause yes no absolutely so um before the menopause we you have to imagine that there's a really tightly controlled feedback mechanism that means that your estrogen flows up and down each month and your progesterone flows up and down in the second half of your cycle um and testosterone levels are, are a bit more static. So in the perimenopause, so the start of that menopause transition, the feedback mechanisms start to all go a bit haywire. That means that your estrogen levels can fluctuate far more erratically. Um, you don't necessarily ovulate every cycle. That means you don't release an egg every cycle. Your estrogen levels have lower troughs as they're flowing up and down. And the lower troughs mean that you can start to develop symptoms of estrogen deficiency. And that big erratic up and down means that you can develop symptoms such as anxiety and migraine for some women. Progesterone levels are probably also all over the place. And the balance in terms of timing can be slightly out of kilter. And so as Anand said, we know that progesterone sometimes has an effect on some women's brains in um, keeping a lid on anxiety. And so that could be one another mechanism by which anxiety is really commonly heightened in the menopause transition. Testosterone is a bit different for women. The level, instead of blowing up and down, zooming up and down erratically, it slowly starts to decrease from your late 20s and slowly continues to decrease through that menopause transition rather than completely falling off a cliff like estrogen does. And then of course the post-menopause is when you haven't had a period for more than a year, the estrogen levels are low, progesterone levels are low, and they stay low forevermore. So the period of adaptation in your body, in your brain, is that adaptation to that low level, virtually no estrogen, virtually no progesterone. Um, but I know, Anand, it's quite different for men. 
Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, and it's really great that we're being able to talk about men here because actually there's such a profound issue in terms of our life expectancy. So we know that the life expectancy gap between men and women is increasing. So by about 2030, there's going to be a 10 year gap. So you know, men's lives will be 10 years shorter on average than women's. 20% of men are going to die before they hit retirement, so before 65, and up to 50% of men's deaths are preventable. So all of these things are worse in men than in women. Um, and there's lots of different causes for this, partly our biology. I mean, for example, men tend to have a prostate, um, which impacts upon our death rates from prostate cancer, etc. There are social issues, for example, um, if, because men tend to have fewer connections in later life. Loneliness has a profound impact on people's health. It's equivalent to, to smoking 15 a day if you consider yourself lonely. Um, and finally, risk taking. Um, you know, and, not, and this is not true for every man. However, in general, uh, men are more likely to be risk takers than women. Um, but one of the big causes of these issues is a low testosterone. Uh, and you know, the max levels as you know, typically seem pretty similar to women. You know, kind of 20 years old and um, when you've gone through puberty, but then they fall. Um, but it doesn't fall at the same rate. Um, uh, uh, in every person, and it doesn't cause the same symptoms at different levels um, in different people. So that's why diagnosis can sometimes be a bit more difficult. But it's the gradual decline in this testosterone over a man's lifetime um, that's going to be associated with certain symptoms. Um, but remember, there are lots of men that will get to 80, 90, and never necessarily be affected by it, which is why it's different to menopause, where almost all of you know, most women, almost all women will go through it. You know, maybe 40% uh, of men will, maybe one in 10 will actually have symptoms and a low testosterone over 45. So it's a much smaller percentage. There were some um, pretty dramatic stats that you hit us with there, Anand, in terms of the the growing back between uh, male and female lo longevity. So if, if you're a man, how would you know that you have testosterone deficiency syndrome or you have low, low levels of testosterone? Would you know by symptoms? How, how would you know? How do you go about diagnosing it? It's really difficult and that's why it's really helpful to see a specialist in this area because there are lots of disease conditions that sound very similar. Um, and uh, so well, kind of the way that we diagnose it is you have a set of symptoms plus a reduced blood level of testosterone. So the blood test is ideally done within three hours of waking. So if you wake up at seven, ideally have it before 10. If however, you're a shift worker, just what your wake up time plus three hours is kind of your window to have the blood test because your testosterone levels go up to the highest level whilst you sleep. Um, and then they go down during your day. So it's most important to get a blood test within that. And when we talk about symptoms, what are we talking about? Well, really the lack of testosterone kind of means you lose out on the positive benefits of testosterone. So mood is a real big thing. We get lots of men coming to us at the Centre for Men's Health talking about depression. Um, and often they've had antidepressants. It's not really made that much of a difference. They particularly complain about being grumpy and irritable, particularly something their partner has mentioned to them or their children or other people have said you're a bit grumpy and miserable. And part of that comes from a sense of losing your joy in life, like the saturation in the world has been turned down. So that's mood. It also affects your cognitive function. So your motivation and your memory, your drive to achieve things. We find engineers coming to us because visuospatial thought becomes more disordered. So they can't actually work out how things put together like they're used to. Um, issues like movement. So are your physical balance as good? Um, is your um, ability to get those gains, get that muscle development or that progression in the gym that you'd expect with the amount of work that you're doing? And then finally, sexual function, which is kind of libido, which is a desire, really, how interested you are in wanting to have sex. And then also then erectile function, and erectile performance, which is affected. One of the key things about testosterone is it's responsible for the nourishment and nurturing of our penis. So those nighttime erections people have, they're not anything to do with arousal. They're just blood flow to the penis to ensure it stays in a healthy state. So I'm sorry to say that in case you thought that was you being very manly. Well, it kind of is because you're getting all that testosterone that's firing that behind but the lack of it means that actually if you don't have a very high testosterone the nighttime erections fall off and if they do fall off that means you're more likely to have erectile performance issues and potentially if your penis isn't used for a long time um, and basically it can scar uh, and the cells can kill themselves so it's really important in men so look it's brilliant that we're having this conversation because as as we found i think dr claire with the menopause knowledge really is power and so just being aware of what the symptoms are and the things that you can do about it um, can make a huge difference. And I know we're going to come to treatment options in a moment, but Dr. Claire, what are your reflections when you hear uh, Anand mention that myriad of symptoms? It rings a lot of bells, doesn't it? 
I know, isn't it fascinating? Because they're very similar to the symptoms that many women experience as they transition through the menopause, um, you know, with psychological symptoms, with a flattening of mood, some women tipping into clinical depression or anxiety, some women again tipping into clinical anxiety. Um, with that loss of concentration, with the brain fog, it's really fascinating, isn't it? Obviously, physical symptoms may vary because um, the way our anatomy works and the importance of estrogen versus the important, the relative importance of testosterone, but sexual function also. And we know that sexual function, so desire, loss of libido in women can occur directly as a result of loss of estrogen. But testosterone, we know, also does have an important part to play in that in women. There's obviously a lot going on in life. There's all of the physical symptoms that sort of conspire to reduce your sexual desire for many women, but very big overlap in symptoms of men and women with hormone deficiency. It is really very interesting. And, and Claire, um, Dr. Anand mentioned, you know, how he goes about diagnosing low testosterone or testosterone deficiency syndrome. How do you go about diagnosing the menopause and how similar or different is it for, for a male diagnosis? Yeah, so th it was very interesting to see, hear that Dr. Anand said um, diagnosis, blood test and cluster of symptoms. Whereas the issue with the menopause transition is that we know that blood tests really generally aren't that helpful. Blood tests to diagnose the menopause can be helpful if you're under 40. They might be a bit helpful if you're between 40 and 45, but it's mainly actually more helpful to rule out other conditions like thyroid issues, for example. And then after that, they're really, blood tests aren't helpful. And that's because the story with female hormone patterns is so different because they really do fluctuate erratically. So if you have a blood test that indicates that you might be in the menopause transition, it, the next day it might be completely different, it might be normal, or you might be having the worst hot flushes ever, but your blood test might be normal. So they're not really that helpful. It's far more important to listen to symptoms, to look at the bleeding pattern, to put all of the other bits of the history together. Like for example, are you taking hormones? Are you using contraception? For example, as in our menopause questionnaire, which is available for free on the website, it is a bit more complicated. It would be nice if it was as more. It was a bit more straightforward. But I'm sure, Doctor Anand, it isn't always straightforward. Is that right? <laughs> no, I think the issue is that we're 20 years behind where menopause is. We mm. may find that actually these levels are not as consistent as we think they are, and we may find that actually the measuring of them isn't as helpful as we thought they are. But unfortunately we've had a torrid history with trying to get a reputation within testosterone deficiency as actually recognized as a real condition nice guidance which is the nationalized guidance to, to suggest sort of quality care and evidence-based medicine doesn't even bother to judge on it even though we know it's a real condition even though we have patients suffering terribly from it so i, I i'm really sort of uh, inspired by the the, the the progress in menopause and i'm hoping the same will happen to low testosterone and testosterone deficiency and the recognition will build up because we know that low testosterone is associated with abdominal weight gain and abdominal weight around your middle um, leads to issues with hormonal disruption which is linked to heart disease and 22 different individual cancers and you know and when men have diabetes or, or a, a low testosterone sorry, the diabetes or heart disease and a low testosterone they're then much more likely to die from that condition there becomes a massive survival gap between groups who have the illness and a normal testosterone and those that have the illness and a low testosterone so we're really hoping to try and close that gap between our men with low testosterone and our men without but equally that gap between all men and women um, and, and I'm really it's profoundly important to see all the, the, the strides forward in menopause care um, and, and also having talks like this, which is brilliant, but actually it'd be lovely for us to catch up um, with, with, with basically Claire. <laughs> now, I think if anybody has any questions, please do pop them into the chat and we'll either feed them in as we're having the conversation or we'll, we'll take them at the end. And then before, and Claire, before we move on to... Um, talk about uh you know solutions and things that you can do to manage symptoms um 
Ananda, it would be really helpful if you could help us with terminology here, because we hear a lot of words bandied about. We hear male menopause, we hear andropause, we hear low testosterone, testosterone deficiency syndrome. If we could start with the one that Claire and I often, very often get, which is, right, you've come and you've given a webinar on menopause. It's fantastic to have that demystified, demystified but is there actually a male menopause as well? So the answer is no, not really. I mean, there are, as we said, so 40% of men, up to 40% of men over 45 will have a low testosterone, but only one in 10 men, um, uh, up to one in 10 men will have low testosterone plus their symptoms, which is nowhere near the magnitude of women who are having those symptoms. But if we look forward in about 2045, half of all men will be 45 and above because we've got an aging population, up to 7 million of them at that time will have a low testosterone, not necessarily symptoms, but that's a huge volume of men that are affected potentially by mood issues, memory issues, um, abilities in sexual function, muscle gain, um, you know, change in body distribution, therefore at high risk of diabetes, heart disease, etc. So uh, andropause, yes, it's not everyone, it's, it's not equivalent to the menopause, but it is, a it is like the menopause, a decline in the amount of hormone yeah. in the body and the profound physical and psychological effect it can have, which is like the menopause. Um, so I think it is quite similar. Testosterone deficiency syndrome is kind of really what andropause is. It's more a very clear, like, you know, it's, you, you've got testosterone, there's a lack of it. And syndrome just means an umbrella term for lots of different symptoms that you push together to make the diagnosis. Because sometimes it could be thyroid disease, it could be, um, it could be anemia, it could be, even be a cancer that can be the cause of all of these things overlapping, which is why it's really helpful to speak to a specialist about it. Brilliant. And we've had a few questions come in. I'm going to put a couple into the conversation now because they're very timely. And Angela, your question on HRT, we will definitely come to it when we uh, look at treatment options. Um, so, Anand, as you're talking about symptoms, and Claire, I think you probably want to pick up on this as well because we get this a lot too from women. Uh, the question here, Anand, is does that mean that men, men's middle age spread is caused through low testosterone? Question. So sometimes, yes, but not always, because also men tend to exercise less as they get older and we tend to eat the wrong things. We're a chronically sleep deprived society. And unfortunately, when we have poor sleep, so um, you know, up to 20 uh, 20 percent of men have sleep apnea where we stop breathing at times during the night, often at a lower level that we can't actually recognize. So we don't think we've been that disrupted. But actually, because of that chronic damage to our sleep cycle, our testosterone level falls. And our cortisol, which is our stress hormone, goes up. That generally means you digest muscle, you build fat, and you lose basically concentration and focus. So it's really problematic to even have sleep disruption. So we have sleep disruption, we have stressful lives, we have jobs um, that, are, that are keeping us, making us worried. We've got kids um, keeping up, uh, us at night. We've got a lack of social relationships. There's so many things that can cause these issues. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's really important to consider them in the round. Yeah, and we're, we're going to come to the happy solutions in a moment. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and that's <laughs> thing, I'm not trying to depress you. Like, <laughs> no, no, is, I know. There is I'm this teasing. gap between men and women, yeah. but actually it is, it is something we can translate into by, by living better lives. Um, and I don't yeah. need to prove like that. It's just like, it, and again, it's hard. Don't get me wrong. I get it's hard. No, I know. And we, I'm smiling because we, we do get this question about middle age spread. So Claire, it really interesting. We just see the contrast for women and middle age spread as well. And it really was a great question. Yes, no, absolutely. And I really agree with most of what, well, well with everything that as, as um, Anand has said in that, you know, lifestyle changes, being busy, being that squeeze, they call it the sandwich generation, you're squeezed by both sides, uh, both sides. But no, but when we lose estrogen also, we start to develop something called insulin resistance. And that means that we don't handle carbohydrates in quite the same way as we used to. And so you're more, much more likely to put weight on around your middle. So fat is redistributed from say your thighs. So you turn from a classical pear shape into more of an apple shape. And then the very presence of that fat around your middle can then make the insulin resistance worse. Again, just making it more likely that any extra carbohydrate is stored as fat around the middle. And then as Anand said, with poor sleep, with stress, our cortisol levels are higher. Our cortisol levels are also higher because of a lot of estrogen. 
cortisol being the level of stress. And again, that can mean that you're also more likely to put or keep hold of fat. So lots of different factors, um, but definitely hormones having an impact. I think that was definitely a key thing that Claire said about the uh, insulin uh, sensitivity or otherwise. That's a key feature of low testosterone as well. You don't deal with your sugar as well. Um, and that means the, the fat, and it's a vicious cycle. You know, the, the, the lower your testosterone gets, the more problems with your insulin, um, which means you're more likely to get diabetes, which means like you're more likely to have problems with your sugar control. Um, so you're going to get even bigger. And the chemicals that fat releases, unfortunately, increase your risk of cancer. So the more fat you've got, the more likely you are to release these cancer causing chemicals and releasing further hormone disruptor chemicals that damage the conversation your brain is having with your genitals to create that testosterone. Plus, these chemicals also damage the lining of blood vessels, leading to an increased risk of heart disease, stroke and erectile performance. So it, it's one of those things where, yes, we talk about big middles and yes, it's an issue. The reason it is, is because of the profound effects it has. Plus, there's a massive problem with the way we look at food in terms of the way it's organized in our supermarkets and how you know, uh, uh, that sugar is, is prioritized, fats prioritized, how uh, we've got companies trying to make everything beige and soft um, uh, rather than looking at a much broader picture of food in terms of stuff that's healthy for us. Yeah, and I've, I've just put that's the great points, guys, and I've just put a link into the chat um, for an event that we did a few weeks ago on nutrition and the mm. menopause, but I think a lot of the points in there pick up on what you've just mentioned and, and as well about, you know, the, the foods that we eat and what we could do. Now, a question for both of you. What are normal levels of testosterone for men and for women? Shall I go first and then we can compare and contrast? Um, the level of testosterone does vary from lab to lab because it is tricky to measure. But where I'm based in Leeds, the level of testosterone is up to 1.8 nanomoles per litre for a woman. So again, they, they vary from lab to lab, which is why the British Society of Sexual Medicine has created action levels rather than lab levels. So these are levels at which you could consider someone as definitely having a low testosterone or having a borderline testosterone. So definitely a low testosterone is usually a total testosterone. That's all of your circulating testosterone being eight nanomoles or less. So it's significantly more than you find in women. Then the uncertain may have testosterone deficiency is between eight and 12. And then a, a sort of probably normal is above 12. Now, the reason I say total testosterone is because a lot of our testosterone is actually bound to certain proteins protein called sex hormone binding globulin. It's kind of like a Pac-Man that grabs hold of your testosterone and won't let go. So we do a calculation using the SHBG um, protein numbers. So we measure that as well. And we can then tell you what your free testosterone is. Because some, as you get older, your sex hormone binding globulin gets higher and higher as your testosterone falls. So your free testosterone falls faster than your total testosterone does. So if you're borderline or have significant symptoms, or have other health conditions, particularly diabetes or pre-diabetes, where you've got sugar control problems, but it's not quite got to that level, and that's 14 million people in the UK have that sort of issue, then we're talking about you probably need to have your SHBG checked, checked as well to try and see whether you're actually lower than you look with your total testosterone. Brilliant, thank you. So just coming on to then, um, so we, we've now got a really good understanding of symptoms in men and women, you know, hormone fluctuations, how it gets diagnosed. So the really important next point then is if you have low testosterone levels or testosterone deficiency syndrome or andropause, or if you're experiencing symptoms as you go through the menopause transition, what are the recommendations that you give to the people that you see in your clinic, the men and women that you see in your, in your clinic? If you'd like to go first. Anand, why don't you talk about testosterone replacement first, and then I can talk about it in the context of HRT. Love that. Thank you so much. Um, so basically, I, I mean, once you've identified that there's an issue, if you're able to, then really we always say lifestyle first. Um, trying to make sure that your exercise and your diet are on track as much as possible. Now, the idea isn't that you're meant to have the perfect lifestyle all the time. You're allowed to have the odd pizza. You're allowed to have you know, chocolate. The issue is that for a lot of us, we're having highly processed foods, providing the calories of up to 70% of 
of our meals even more in some people. And that is problematic because all of some of these can act as hormone disruptors. And also they, um, they, they don't uh, behave well in terms of providing food for our gut microbiome. So we want to definitely look at exercise, definitely look at diet. They find that if you're 40 and above, the best source of exercise is resistance exercise. That's weights with one episode of high intensity training, HIIT training per week. So if you can exercise three to four times a week and then th and, and one of those can be a HIIT exercise, that's great. Um, if you improve your sleep, again, we've talked about how important that is. Getting any treatment you need for your mood disorders. If you do have you know, underlying uh, you know, um, anxiety, depression, et cetera, please do get that treated as well. But if those are all, you know, if those are all kind of you have worked on them perhaps for six months, or you already have something like pre-diabetes or diabetes, you may want to start treatment immediately. And that treatment is then based upon whether you want to keep to keep your fertility or not. Because if you have external testosterone treatment and you do not um, and you, and you, sorry, when you get given external testosterone treatment, it communicates to the brain that there's plenty of testosterone. So your brain stops communicating to your testicles. Unfortunately, part of that communication is a signal to tell the testicles to continue to make sperm. So if you want to keep your fertility, you cannot be given testosterone on its own. You will likely be given a chemical um, or, or a drug um, like clomiphene. Um, clomiphene basically is used in women, often in infertility, who, who basically stimulates their ovaries to make eggs. But if you use it in men, it stimulates their, uh, their testicles to make sperm. And that will also, as a side benefit, increase their testosterone as well. Um, so it's, it first decision is made on fertility or not. If fertility, then we have a specific set of drugs we can offer you, uh, but not testosterone on its own. If, however, you're happy with potentially having a decrease in your fertility and up to two thirds of people on testosterone therapy have a reduced fertility, up to one third can have a long term reduced fertility, even if you stop the testosterone. So then you will be offered testosterone in either the form of a gel or an injection. There used to be things like patches and tablets, but they're not very much present in the UK, but they perhaps will be taking a comeback because they're being introduced in larger centers like Australia and America. So they may then be crossing the pond to get to us. That's really requires, helpful. Sorry, but I will say that all of this requires lots of you know, monitoring to make sure your prostate is, 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 is assessed, to make sure heart health, diabetes, et cetera, is under monitoring when you're on, when you're on treatment to keep the risks as low as possible. So does that mean that you need to go for regular blood tests and, and, and health checks, Anand, when you're, if you're taking this therapy? Absolutely. And I mean, it's very likely that there's going to be no problem and, you're, and actually your body health will get better, your heart disease risk comes down, your mood gets better. However, we do also check to make sure your prostate isn't getting larger and potentially cancerous. There is lots of evidence that actually testosterone therapy does not cause prostate cancer. Testosterone therapy does not cause heart attacks. So that's very pleasing that we have that. But we monitor it anyway, partly as a sort of historical thing, but equally because we wouldn't want to miss it. So the first year, you'll have lots of testing. After that, when you're stable on treatment, it'll be six months, be then yearly. So it'll get less and less as you get sort of more established on treatment. Well, I'm sure we'd have loads of questions to come back to you on, but we'll come to Claire. Just very one quick question for you to clarify before Claire talks to us about the main ways of treating menopause symptoms. There's a question here from Francis, just to check on what, what are SHDG levels, please? I think we just missed the, uh, your Apologies. description of that. So SHBG is sex hormone binding globulin that's present in men or women. And it's a protein, so a, a, a protein in the blood that grabs onto um, sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. And it means they're basically inactive for use in the body because you want them to be freely floating around in the bloodstream, not attached to a protein. So having high levels of SHBG mean you have lower um, uh, circulating free levels. Thank you. And thanks for popping that in the chat as well. That's great, guys. Claire, um, what are the, the main ways of managing menopause symptoms then? Yes. So like Dr. Anand said, so start with lifestyle changes. So if we think about managing the menopause, we're thinking about managing symptoms, taking the edge off symptoms to allow you to live your best life, and but also to help manage the long-term health consequences of the menopause, so namely heart disease and osteoporosis. And we're increasingly thinking that dementia may come into that equation as well. So lifestyle choices, so obviously reducing smoking and alcohol can really help all aspects of health. 
and exercise increases well-being, we know it can take the edge off menopause symptoms. There'll be alternative therapies that will be helpful to some women, um, mindfulness, meditation also, so talking therapies, just trying to create space when your brain is feeling really frazzled. And cognitive behavioral therapy is a talking therapy. There is really good evidence that it can help the psychological and physical symptoms of the menopause by just trying to break some of the vicious negative cycles that can be set up. Um, there's herbal medicines that some women will find helpful. And I saw there's a comment about that um, in the chat. Although you do just have to be wary that herbal medicines can interact with prescription medications um, for a really important interaction with, for example, St. John's wort and epilepsy medication, the combined pill, it can reduce the um, how effective it is and tamoxifen also. There are medications that are not HRT that can be helpful. So um, antidepressants have a part to play for some women if they need them. Um, and there are other tablets that can be helpful in taking the edge off hot flushes. But then it's hormone replacement therapy. It's giving you back enough estrogen to just take the edge off symptoms to reduce those long term health consequences of the menopause that is probably well is for most women, not everybody, but for most women, the most effective way of managing symptoms of the menopause and as well as reducing the long term health consequences. Um, you don't have to take HRT. It is not a necessity, but many, many women will find that it is helpful to them. Thank you, Claire. And we've just, while we're on HRT, we've had a question around the impact of um, HRT on fibroids. So any, and I'm just, I know we've got an article on that. I'm just going to pop that into the chat as well. Yes, great question. So fibroids are little um, non-cancerous growths in the wall usually of the womb. They, they're little knots of muscle that sit either protruding into the cavity of the womb, either in the wall of the womb, or sometimes they're like little knobbly bits on the outside of the womb. And their growth is driven and maintained by estrogen. So sometimes there is anxiety about adding estrogen back if you've got fibroids and would it make them grow. The, the reality is that fibroids usually shrink after the menopause. If you give HRT, it usually stops them. Well, if it's going to have any effect, it may be to stop them shrinking so quickly occasionally the HRT will make the fibroid increase in size by a small amount. But we don't think that that necessarily increases the extremely rare risk of cancerous cells developing in that fibroid. So it's usually absolutely fine to have HRT if you've got fibroids. Occasionally, we monitor them if they're particularly big, if there's worry about the size of them. And as Helen said, um, we've got an information leaflet on fibroids that she's posted in the chat there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claire, for that. Uh, Anand, there's a really great question here, and I'm sure this is one that you come across a lot. I know on the menopause side, Claire definitely does. Uh, thank you, Francis, for this question. Uh, so Francis is saying um, their GP seems less keen to refer her partner, who's a man, to a specialist despite pre-diabetes and testosterone of 14 and all of the symptoms that you mentioned earlier, Anand. Do you have any tips on what they can do to get help? That's a brilliant question. Thank you so much for sharing it. Also very timely because the 2023 testosterone guidance has just come out from the British Society of Sexual Medicine and it confirms that um, for, for if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic and have a testosterone level of 14, you should be considered for treatment. So that literally came out about the last two weeks. So if you do have a sugar level problem, then actually you should be considered for testosterone at a higher level of testosterone than the average population. So it's really important that you, you might want to actually share that with them. Let me just pop that in the chat box. Um, what we've got in there, we've got a questionnaire uh, from the Centre for Men's Health in case you think you might have it. Um, you've mentioned that, you know, that your, your husband or partner already has the symptoms. But what I'll do is I'll put in um, the, the, uh, the long version of this document. They are producing a short version, which will really sort of uh, condense it and make it much more manageable. Because um, 
we're never taught about this at medical school. We were taught about menopause. We were never taught about, well, to a degree about menopause. Mm. We were never taught to a great degree about any testosterone issues, any sexual function issues. I was not taught about testosterone deficiency at um, uh, medical, sorry, medical school, then uh, GP training. It's only I came out to it after I'd finished my training and went to try and seek information about it. So there's lots of doctors that won't know about it. Equally, you have the different types of specialist doctors who then either poo poo it or are very pro it um, because it's still not as embraced as menopause is. Um, and that's something we're really trying to change. And it's great that, you know, uh, that my medical center have invited me. So thanks, Claire and Helen, for inviting me to visit Restless. Now, and, and, and um, I've put a link into your questionnaire on the Center for Men's Health. But if you could um, paste uh, what you just described in terms yeah, of the new guidance that, that comes comes out, so Francis can be armed with the facts in going back to the doctor. And Terry, this is something you see as well, isn't it? Where um, sometimes women struggle to to really get cut through with their with their GP. Yes, and so it's not being afraid to ask again and ask again if you need to ask again to try a different GP. But, um, Anand, I'm just quite interested. Do you think, because the number of men's health specialists, it, I'm guessing, well, from my GP point of view, few and far between, do you think a referral to a urologist, if you were looking for a specialist, would it be a urologist with an interest in testosterone deficiency that you would need? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're often called andrologists rather than, uh, because they're, they're weirdly, the urologists subspecialize into andrology, even though it's kind of the same okay. thing. But actually, so if you're looking for a specific one, look for one that says andrology, because they're going to look at your male hormones. Some urologists just look at the structures like, your, you know, your prostate or your, or your penis or something like that. They won't necessarily be looking um, at your, uh, your hormone level. So andrology is often more helpful. Endocrinologists can be a bit more focused on levels and a bit less focused on how you are as a person, in my experience. So I'm not judging all of them. I'm just, mm -hmm. just saying that's been our experience when trying to get um, endocrinologists to recognize the deficiency. Mm. Yeah, so clear, clearly a way to go. And one of the things I do want to come back to before we close tonight is um, how to drive more awareness of men's health amongst men. It, it's interesting to see that we have predominantly women on the webinar tonight um, and so it would be good to get views and thoughts from everybody in the chat on that in terms of what they think uh, particularly yeah, men and women what you could do to get your partner interested in this because I'm still shocked by the statistic that Anand mentioned at the top in terms of the growing gap uh, between uh, male and female longevity and the fact was it Anand one in five men will be dead before they retire yeah I mean absolutely. that's pretty horrifying you know when there are things that you can do to prevent it. And if one of those is your partner, I don't think anybody wants that to happen to, to, to their partner. So we will come back to that though before we close, but some excellent questions as ever coming in through the chat that I think will, will interest, you know, interest everybody. A great one here from Lee. How does chemotherapy or radiotherapy affect testosterone levels and is any effect permanent? Uh, so yes, it has a very profound effect on all um, uh, um, sexual tissue. I mean, I'm certainly sure Claire is, is aware um, that it can age your, um, it, it's, you know, uh, the act of chemotherapy ages your um, uh, ability to, so it, it, what am I trying to say? It, it ages your fertility age by 10 to 15 years. And that's really difficult if you're a woman, say if you're 35 and get breast cancer and are offered chemotherapy, if we're increasing your reproductive age to 50 and you've not had a child yet, what does that mean? You know, for you as someone who might have wanted children at 37, for example, and these can be really difficult last minute decisions to make. You know, you're told you've got breast cancer. You've got 10 minutes to decide whether you're going to have chemotherapy, which might mean turning off your ever having a child. With men, it's slightly different because actually men do make new sperm every 74 days. And even though chemotherapy can damage some of the um, uh, uh, sperm producing cells, it's not always the case that it causes such significant problems. But in both cases, we would often suggest, it, depending on the type of chemotherapy, about storing some of your sperm or, st or, st or storing some eggs. Thank you. Good, good practical advice, Anand. Thank you so much. Um, Claire, I'm going to um, fire slightly mastermind like a few questions on menopause your way. And uh, she's, uh, Claire's well used to this, Anand. Um, and Anand, if you wouldn't mind, while Claire's doing that, because I'll be coming back to you with questions, but maybe 
putting in the chat the name of that guidance. Um, we just had a question back uh, again for the name of the testosterone guidance. Don't worry, I'm, des I'm desperately looking it up. It's actually clearly, Thank I you. can send it separately. It's not actually available. We, uh, and if we can, then we, we will send it out. We'll work with Aideen and the team at Restless and we'll send it out. Thank you so much, Anand. Claire, um, let's start with um, the, um, when, when does one typically go through the menopause and how does it last? So maybe some of the quick numbers in terms yes, of age yeah. and how long it lasts. So the average age of the menopause is 51. So that is defined as having not had a period, if you were having periods for 12 months, and that's when your ovaries permanently stop making estrogen. The perimenopause, menopause transition, lasts on average five years but can last as long as 10 years and typically starts on average age 45 and symptoms can last on average for eight years um, and the symptoms really reflect your body's ability to adapt to the new stage of low estrogen so symptoms can start early in the perimenopause so early in the transition and last long into the post menopause it can be difficult to actually pinpoint when your actual moment of menopause is if you're not bleeding, say you've got a Mirena coil or you're, you're on the mini pill. Um, but it doesn't matter because you, we treat the symptoms and we tailor the HRT as to whether you're bleeding or not. So on average, eight years, but about 15% of women will have symptoms for 15 years or longer. So I see women in my clinic in their 60s, 70s, got a, a few in their 80s even still having hot flushes, um, sadly, as a result of the menopause. But that is rare. And Claire, thank you for that. Very clear. And then linked to that, how long can you use HRT for? So you can use HRT, I would say, as long as you want to take it for. So the HRT obviously has a very small risk of breast cancer over the when you are taking it over the age of 50. So that risk is very small compared with other lifestyle um, factors such as um, drinking two units of alcohol a day has a greater risk of breast cancer than taking the older style HRT. And the risk is probably lower with newer HRT. So as long as you accept that small year-on-year -year risk, I would say you can take HRT for as long as you want to, because while ever you're taking it, as long as you stopped it, started it, sorry, as long as you've started it under the age of 60 or within 10 years of the menopause, it significantly reduces the risk of heart disease and it significantly reduces the risk of osteoporosis. So you're getting the benefits for as long as you're taking the HRT for. Thank you, Claire. And I post, Claire has written some brilliant articles on HRT and understanding the menopause. And I've just pasted the links into the chat as well. Um, now we, we have a question here, Tracy, thank you so much for your question. And I'm so sorry to hear about your um, leg aches and your, your joints hurting so much. We can't obviously give individual advice, but I'll ask question, I'll ask Claire your question in a more general way. So. So with um, joint aches and pains, which, which I think we hear a lot about there, um, Tracy's getting conflicting advice about stopping HRT, starting the patch, or stopping, starting. Mm. Basically, she's on HRT. For somebody who's on HRT and they're still experiencing pretty bad joint aches and pains, what would your advice be to them in general? Yeah, okay. So aches and pains are a common symptom of the menopause because estrogen has an important part to play in our joints. It's probably anti-inflammatory and it probably helps lubrication of joints and it helps maintain the integrity of collagen holding the joint together. So if joint aches and pains are menopause related, often well usually hrt does help and if it doesn't help with the first shot it may be that you need to adjust the dose of estrogen you might need to increase the estrogen etc there are lots of other medical conditions though that cause joint aches and pains and stiffness um, for example osteoarthritis which is wear and tear arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis which is the one where the immune system can attack your joints so if you're on a good dose of HRT and your pains aren't improving, I would be talking to your GP 
to ask what investigations they can offer to look for other causes of your joint pain. And if you're not on HRT, then it is worth trying HRT because it can be helpful. I hope that answer that hits the relevant points. Thank you, Claire. And I posted the article that you wrote on joint aches and pains in as well. Uh, Anand, I see you've pasted the PDF and, and you've given advice on directly the page to go to as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. We've time for just a couple of more questions and then I really would like to get Anand and Claire's thoughts and, and, and views from the room on how we can raise awareness uh, on, on female and male hormonal health and how do we get men talking about men's health as well. Um, so Claire, I think last question on HRT then. If you start HRT before the full menopause, do you continue to have periods uh, and will they continue until you stop HRT? Yes, that's a brilliant question. So there are really, really briefly two types of HRT, one that gives you a monthly bleed and one that doesn't give you a bleed. And you would usually start the one that gives you a monthly bleed, that's called sequential HRT, if you start HRT less than a year from your last period, so you're in the perimenopause, and you take that sequential HRT for a maximum of five years, or until you reach the age of 55, which is when the vast majority of women have stopped having periods. If you start HRT and it's more than a year since your last period, you start the no bleed continuous HRT, shouldn't give you a period. Okay, it, it is quite common to bleed when you first start any type of HRT. Um, it usually settles. So hopefully rule of thumb, um, that's that's what you do. You start one and then you switch to the other with time. Thank you. That's great, Claire. I'm sorry, I spoke too soon. There was a question, two questions that I missed and then I'll come back to Anand. So very quickly, any advice for somebody who finds they're now suffering from vertigo? Oh, vertigo. Yeah, um, speak to your GP. Vertigo, we don't know that it is related to the menopause. Lots of women tell me they have worsening vertigo where the world feels like it's spinning around you in the menopause but there isn't a huge amount of evidence relating to it there are ways of managing it there's a special maneuver that an ENT trained doctor can do to your head to reset the balance and there's medication that can be helpful as well so yeah go and see your GP I'm afraid you probably need treatment that is not hormonal to manage it and check for the causes of it yeah, so so really sorry to hear about that, Helen, and um, ho ho hopefully that's helped. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Claire. So definitely last question, and we're very close to, to the end. Claire and Sam, thank you for your question. Um, so Sam has been on HRT gel for the past three months. It's had good effect, but she's had progesterone introduced through the marina coil, and she's really finding it's impacting mental well-being. So, so generally speaking, mm -hmm. you see that, and what would your advice be to people who, who, are, who are experiencing that? Yeah, Sam, I'm really sorry to hear that, that it is really difficult. And and the off, well, a, a small percentage of women are unfortunately really sensitive to progesterones. And unfortunately, with HRT, you need the hormone progesterone if you have not had a hysterectomy. Estrogen, really briefly, helps all the symptoms, but can thicken the womb lining. And we don't want that to happen. So you have to take the progesterone alongside it. If the Mirena coil isn't settling, and I the Mirena coil side effects usually settle within the first two to three months, then it's worth considering an alternative. So it would probably be helpful for you to speak to a menopause specialist or a GP with an interest in the menopause, because there are better types of progesterone if you are really sensitive to them. Um, there are different types of progesterone that you can try that you might be more likely to tolerate than the Mirena. So I'm really sorry, that is really tricky. And Mirena is very easy to remove. It's not like having it fit when you can blink and it's gone. So go and speak to your GP and have a look on our um, website also, because I know we talk about different types of progesterone and the HRT and progesterone sensitivity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Now, Anand, as, as we move into the last few minutes of our webinar. So you've really helped us to understand how the importance of um, hormones in male health and testosterone in particular, but it, it is quite striking that when, when 
we do events like this, and I know from experience of doing events in the workplace, we tend to get more women than men. And when we get questions, they tend to be more from the women than from the men. So what do you think needs to be done to really get the conversation going? And what role can partners play? And maybe some of the partners who are on the call here tonight play to, to help raise awareness of men's health issues so that that gap closes again. I mean, it is great that we've got so many women on this call and it, it generally is the women or the partners that drive men's interaction with healthcare. Um, because we know that there are lots of opportunities women have often through their life with their you know, cervical screening or you know, children or you know, immunization access that actually men don't have. Um, and, and men may be sent a little um, something in the post saying, come along, have your blood sugars tested or your cholesterol and often ignore it because they feel in general well. So we do less preventative care for ourselves. And we also are less likely to go in if we have a health problem. We're going to leave, leave it till you know, later and we're going to be in denial about it. And then finally, when we do get told we've got a diagnosis, we're less likely to get it treated or wait longer to have it treated. So we're kind of our own world's you know, worst enemy. And obviously, we can talk about toxic masculinity and the structures, uh, you know, cultures we grow up in. Um, but equally, it is about men engaging more in their own care. Um, and, and part of the, 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 thankfully, we often they do have partners who are very engaged at going, but could you just keep living, please? I don't wish to spend my last 10 years on my own. Uh, you know, who's going to do the, the lifting? Um, so you know, there's, there's, there's important things um, out there that we can do. I mean, education in schools needs to happen. We need to talk about, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a country, um, diet and exercise. Uh, yeah, and forgetting about fad diets is actually about what do we need to live well and live healthily, to live longer, healthier lives rather than just living longer lives. You know, we want more of that life to be in good health so we can actually live to enjoy it. Um, so, yeah, I think it has to happen on a much larger scale. But these conversations really help because hopefully you know, you'll talk to your partners, but you'll maybe you'll talk to your friends. And it's great that women are much better at talking to their friends about their issues and their health conditions. Men are very unlikely to mention the fact that they need a hormone replacement um, to keep them a man. Or, for example, if they've got erectile problems, they're not going to tell someone, oh, I need Viagra. But actually, it was really helpful because I got my heart checked out and they found I had mild diabetes. That's not generally going to be the conversation because they have pride or whatever it is. So I think having this conversation, make it more available and you know, uh, hopefully having a few more of these um, through you guys and Restless. Thank you. Thank you, Ananda. And as I said, I've pasted the um, questionnaire that's on your website. Um, so if people want to share that with their partners, they, they might find that helpful. Um, Claire, any closing thoughts or remarks from you? Reflections yes, no. in the evening. Thank you, Helen. Um, I just think it has to be spoken about, don't you? We have to, you know, I didn't know about male testosterone deficiency um, as a GP. We don't have training you know, as Anand presented those stark statistics, I think we just have to keep talking about it. We keep having to raise the awareness um, and the women folk have to continue to drag their men folk to the GP. And, and you know, and it's great that there is um, easily accessible information through the Centre for Men's Health. You know, there are now ways of helping yourself towards a diagnosis to be able to take to your doctor and ask about it. So it's got, yes, awareness, awareness, talking, talking, talking. Brilliant, thank you. Claire and Anand, thank you so much for a really informative and helpful conversation. And with that, Aideen, back to you. Thanks, Helen. And yes, thanks from Restless as well for such a great event this evening. As always, lots of uh, wonderful advice. So thanks, Helen, Dr. Claire and Dr. Anand. Um, and also for answering so many of our members' questions too. And of course, thank you very much to all the members who joined this evening um, and for all the great questions that you posted too. Hopefully you found it all very, very helpful. Um, if you'd like further information or would like to speak to the experts, please feel free to contact hello at mymenopausecenter.com. And following the event, you will receive a link to the recording in case you'd like to share or rewatch. So once again, thank you all and have a lovely evening. Good night and bye. Good night. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.